To God be the glory. Great things he has done. I don't know about you, but I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Do I have a witness that the Lord is good? His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. And if you're glad you are worth saving, let's put your hands together for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords one more time, giving his name the praise that he deserves. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God today. If you don't mind, just join me in just affirming the ministry of Anthony Brown and group therapy one more time with a hearty amen. We praise God as well for the ministry of our praise team and the Aeolians. Let's give them an amen as well. We thank you all so much for warming our hearts to be able to receive the word of the living God. Good afternoon, Oakwood. I want you to know, family, that I am elated and eager about the opportunity to begin this journey together by faith. And I just want to begin, before we get into the Word, I just want to start by showing my robust appreciation for anybody that took the time to say a prayer, to share a verse, to speak a word of faith while we were in that season of transition. If you took the time to come out of town to support today, I want you to know that you have our indebtedness, your willingness to adjust your life, to make a deposit into ours is something that is greatly appreciated. And so I thank God for our village. And then secondly, I want to just take a moment to say thank you and show affirmation for my predecessor in both the University Church and in Breath of Life, Dr. Carlton Bird. Can we give him a hearty amen today? I don't believe, family, that it can be overstated that Dr. Bird and his wife, Danielle, they are once in a generation type of leaders. And as I have assumed these responsibilities and have I get a sense of what they all entail, I am more appreciative of the fact that Dr. Bird had a determination and evangelistic rage and the ability to make very hard things look easy. And so we thank God for Dr. Bird, Danielle, their family, and their deposits into Breath of Life and Oakwood. Once again, can you say amen? amen. Then I want to just take a few more moments. I want to affirm the prayerful leadership of our conference administration, starting with my president, Elder Jones, our secretary, Elder Bailey, and the best treasurer ever, Sister Sonia Creighton. I thank you all for your prayerful shepherding of this process and for entrusting me to steward this responsibility. I want you to know that you will get my very best effort to validate the trust that you've given me to be able to lead God's people in this way. And I want to also say a word of appreciation to the first family of this university, Doctors Leslie and Prudence Pollard. Can we give them an amen today? I want you to know, family, that I've appreciated your friendship and your encouragement over the years. I thank you for your sage-like counsel and my prayer is that between my office and yours, we would have a meaningful collaboration that would allow these young people to be deepened spiritually, to be transformed in Christ, to be great servants of God, mighty in the land. And so you have our support. We are Team Oakwood all the way. And so we praise God for your ministry and your leadership. And then I want to just take a brief moment to thank God for those individuals that came from the North American Division, Dr. Watkins and Dr. Valentine, for coming all the way here to Huntsville. I praise God for your words of encouragement, for your prayers, your willingness to work with us in this endeavor. And my prayer is that under your tutelage and guidance, we will do something that will honor God and help be able to grow his amazing work. And then I just want to introduce you to some special people. I want to just acknowledge real quick my parents who are here today and my brother. We just raise your hand. I'm not going to have them stand, but my parents are right here. I want you to know that God providentially moved them and relocated them here to Huntsville about a year ago. And I know it was God's hand because I don't know that we could have even entertained Breath of Life or this responsibility without the support of our village. And so we dangled the grandkids as leverage to get them here. 
they took the bait, and we praise God that mom and dad are close by. And so when you see them around, please be kind to uh, mom and dad and show them love. They are not divas. They are high character, but they are low maintenance. Come on and say amen. And so we praise God for them. And I just want to take a moment to just appreciate and show love to my amazing wife, Gianna. I want you all to know that Gianna holds this man down in every conceivable way. I've been blessed now to be married to this lady for 18 years, 20 days, about 21 hours, about 42 minutes, and about 32 seconds. And every day with her gets a little sweeter than the day before. I praise God for your prayers, your support, your words of encouragement. And I just want you to know, friends of mine, as we assume these heavy responsibilities, I want you to know that my family is not a priority. I want you to know they are the priority. Both breath of life and pastoring this church come a distant second to being the priority of making sure this family is saved. And because I can't afford to lose them, sometimes you're going to hear the pastor say no. Sometimes you're going to hear me say I can't make it. No, no, I'm all the way in with the ministry, but I cannot lose them trying to accommodate each and every one of you. And so... I want you to hear my heart. We're all the way in, but I just want you to be clear on what the priority is so that we will operate in margin and we will do things decently and in order. And I want to thank God for my father-in-law who could not be here. He is my Jethro. He and my wife's mother. I thank you for your prayers and support as well. And then I want to thank God for the Breath of Life staff, the Oakwood University Church media team, our ministers of music, all of those that push through great resistance this week. Church, y'all don't know what's been happening behind the scenes, but we are here because there are some dedicated servants of God, some Levites that decided to push through so that we could have today's service. And, and last but certainly not least, I want to just take a moment to acknowledge and thank God for the Oakwood University Church pastoral team. Dr. Williams, who could not be here, Pastor Raphael, Pastor Goodridge, I look forward to the journey together. I am clear on the fact that I'm not coming to function as Savior. I am here to join with you in ministry, to be able to grow the work of God so that Jesus Christ might come. Can the church say amen? And, and then I just want to just take two more quick seconds. I, I understand and I got word that a very special person decided to make the trip here. I want to invite Sister Patricia Pearson to stand. The wife of our, our great soldier of Christ, Elder Walter Pearson, drove in from Atlanta today. God bless you, Sister Pearson. I thank you for your prayers, your encouragement, and your willingness to come and spend time with us today. And also, there are a number of preachers that came in from out of town who left their desk uh, that be with us today. Would you just stand so I can just recognize you? I see Dr. Knight and I think Pastor Carragher, Chaplain Johnson, Hill, a number of others are in the house of the Lord. Let's give them a hearty amen as well, as long as well as some of the members of the pastoral staff at First Church. We thank God for you. Thank you so much for indulging me in that today. How many of us need a word from the Lord today? I know the hour is late, but there is still something that God wants to say to his people today. And so do me a favor and stand with me as we take our Bibles and go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. And we'll look together at verse number 1. 1 Samuel chapter 16. And we'll look together at verse number 1. When you get there, say, Pastor, I'm here. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse number 1. I'll be reading from the New King, King James Version of the Bible. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse number 1. Again, when you get there, just verify by saying, I'm here. The Bible says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, 
How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from being by from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. But the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one that I named to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to sacrifice. And so it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. And the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord, hear this church, does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him to pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made uh, seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Then he said, There remains yet the youngest, and there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. So he brought him in, and he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him. And in the midst of his brothers, the spirit of the Lord came upon him from that day forward. And so Samuel arose and went to Ramah. But I want to read for emphasis verse number 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I've refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Today, saints, I want to talk to you under the subject, looks can be deceiving. Looks can be deceiving. Let's pray together. Father, I need an anointing that is sufficient for this hour. I don't mind acknowledging that talent is not enough. Experience is not enough. The only thing that suffices is your spirit. So, Father, I pray that you would make yourself dense in this room. I pray that the building and the people will both swell because of your presence. And so I'm praying that in the hearing of the word, that faith will be multiplied exponentially. Once again, would you please hide me in the shadows of the cross, that Jesus alone might be seen, that Christ alone would be heard. And at the end of our time together, may Jesus alone be praised. We ask this in the name of him who is altogether lovely. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Let God's people say together, amen and amen. You may be seated in the house of God today. Again, we're talking under the subject, looks can be deceiving. You know, saints, when I was about 15 years old, I accompanied my aunt to the neighborhood car wash to help her clean and detail her family van. And if you've ever been to a hood car wash, you know it's a space where many worlds tend to collide. You see, a hood car wash is like a hybrid flea market. 
so that before you went to get everything at Walmart, you used to be able to get everything at the car wash. So when you went to the car wash, you could get your car clean, you could buy some used tires, you could get some frozen meat, you could get some weed for your head, you could get some black art and CDs all at the car wash. And I remember we went one particular day and there was a street merchant that was selling handheld camcorders, which was all the rage at that time. And so he had the camcorder outside of the box as a display so he could show the camera's capabilities and its features. And after seeing the demonstration, my aunt was convinced to purchase one of the cameras. But I need you to know that things quickly went left as soon as the money changed hands. See, we noticed that as soon as he got his money, he quickly packed up his table and jumped in the hoopty that already had the engine running. And so we noticed that something was wrong, and so we quickly tried to open up the box. But the box was sealed in this very thick masking tape that made it really hard for us to open. And by this time, our street salesman had fled the scene of his crime. And by the time we opened it up, to my aunt's surprise, she realized that she spent $70 for a brick that had been hidden inside of a pretty package. And I need you to know, saints, that the deception was in the packaging because there was the barcode still on the nice package. There was a picture of the camera on the nice package. The package was still neatly and pristinely sealed, but there was no substance or content on the inside. And understand that my aunt put the brick over her mantle in her house as a reminder to never commit to pretty packaging if you've never investigated what's on the inside. And see, too often, my friends, we find ourselves blindsided because we make investments on nice packaging without investigating what's on the inside. And see, this, friends, is a call away from making surface evaluations. You see, too often, we wind up being hurt because we make surface evaluation of people, of things, and of opportunities. And there are times that we get burned simply because we decide based upon how it looks. Am I preaching to anybody today? In fact, the truth is that there are some of us that have chased after bad money because we saw how the pyramid scheme looked on paper, but we didn't investigate the character of the one making the demonstration. There are times we got our hearts broken because we looked at their build or their physique, but we didn't look at what was on the inside. Sometimes we buy the wrong car because we get blinded by the rims, but we don't read the Carfax. Sometimes we compromise our health because we buy food based on how it tastes and not the ingredients. And I guess what I'm saying, friends, is that God wants us to get to a place where we are more discerning in our judgments, more prayerful in our process, more diligent in our research, where we stop moving by our feelings and start functioning by our faith. And at some point, you've got to stop going by how it looks because how many of us know that sometimes looks can be deceiving? Are you hearing me today, saints? And so go back with me, if you don't mind, to 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse number 1. 1 Samuel 16 and verse number 1. When you get there, say amen. 1 Samuel 16. The Bible says, now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing as I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go, for I am sending you to Jesse, for I have provided myself a king amongst his sons. Now, friends of mine, I need you to get today that this text provides many great lessons for the people of God, but the first thing it teaches us is that whenever God withdraws his anointing, you need to also withdraw your attachments. Oh, okay, 
Let me say it to those on this side, that whenever God withdraws his anointing, you need to simultaneously start collecting your attachments. Now, 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 I need you to get friends of mine that this relational dynamic between Saul and Samuel is not this compartmentalized relationship. I need you to be clear that they have emotional overlap. In other words, Saul has, Samuel has spent great time pouring into Saul. In other words, he has seen him grow from being a young man too shy to being noticed to being the first king in the lineage of the kings of the children of Israel. And I need you to know that he has counseled Saul through difficulty. He has mentored him through uncertainty. He has seen God fight for Saul as the nation was established into a kingdom. And here we find the prophet of God so deep into his feelings that he is weeping even though God has withdrawn on his anointing and understand friends that God's problem with Samuel is not that he is weeping the problem is that Samuel has been weeping a little too long in other words, God is saying to Samuel and to some of us that you ought to be done crying about that by now. God is saying to somebody, you ought to be over that by now. The issue with Samuel is there is a reluctance to accept what God has already declared. And God is wanting Samuel to know that when I withdraw my anointing, you've got to withdraw your attachments. See, see, saints, I need you to get that, that God understands the stages of grief. Are y'all hearing me today, church? In other words, he knows that when you go through grief, that there's going to be a season of denial. He knows you're going to go through a season where there's anger and depression. He knows there's going to be a stretch where you bargain for a change of your reality. But eventually, your grief rounds to a place where there is an acceptance of what has taken place. But somewhere in Samuel's life, there is an emotional arrested development that is so bad that he cannot see his way clear. And God has to make the announcement to Samuel that you've been crying just a little bit too long. Are y'all hearing me, church? And see, I need somebody to understand what God is saying. He has to announce to him that the season of grief is over. He has to announce to him that a better day is ahead. He has to alert the prophet that your best days are not behind you, but your best days are in front of you. He's got to let him know that when I withdraw my anointing, you got to withdraw your attachments. And I guess what I want somebody to know early in this year is that you will never be able to see where God is if you're still weeping over where God was. Mm. In other words, God is saying you're weeping over the past too long. God is saying to somebody, you're trying to water dead plants. It's time to stop singing the same sad song. It's time for you to stop reliving that same ugly story because if I've taken away my anointing, you ought to take away your tears. And I just want to say to somebody that there comes a point in time where you've got to stop crying over what was. In other words, there is somebody that needs to stop weeping over the job that you used to have. You've got to stop weeping over the way church was before the pandemic. You've got to stop weeping over folk that you used to be tight with. You've got to stop weeping over the boyfriend who's with somebody else. You've got to stop weeping over the girlfriend that's gotten remarried. And I need somebody to know this, is that if they were willing to move on from you, that just means that you got power to move on from them. In other words, saints, if they see you as optional, don't you treat them as essential way to church at today. In other words,
words, if they moved on, guess what? It's time for you to go on. And if God withdraws his anointing over here, it's because he wants to lay it somewhere else. And do I have at least seven folk like Mary Mary that are willing to say, I've cried my last tear on yesterday. Are y'all hearing me, church? And see, I need somebody to understand this in the spirit, that whenever God closes one door, that means God is going to open another door. Uh, let me say it this way. I remember growing up in my house uh, in the hallway where the bedrooms were. All the bedrooms were on one narrow hallway. But one of the things that would happen is that whenever my dad would close the door to his bedroom, the closing of the door would create a vacuum or a push that would cause another door to open up. And in other words, whenever one door was closed, it will create a push for another door to open. Y'all didn't catch that today. And how many of us know that whenever God closes one door, the Spirit is going to create a push for another door to open up? So if God closes one relationship door, God is going to create the push for another one to open up. If God closes one job door, he's going to open up another job door. If God closes one medical door, he's going to create the push for healing another way. And is there anybody that's got enough maturity to say, Lord, I thank you for closed doors? Because when you close the wrong one, you're just freeing me to walk in the right one. Are you hearing me today, church? The second thing that this story teaches us, friends of mine, is that at some point you've got to stop investing in your mistakes. Now, church, I need you to hear me on this because, see, there is a reason that your boy Samuel is weeping so badly for Saul. See, the reason he is crying so hard is that as an older man, he's put a whole lot of energy into Saul. He's made a lot of investments into Saul. He has poured his entire life into Saul. And, and for God to just move on from the one that he has poured so much into, I need you to know that that is disappointing to the one that has made the investment. And there is a part of Samuel that's thinking that we just need to fix Saul, that we just need to redeem Saul. In other words, I've given so much to him that I don't even got the strength to start over with nobody else. And see, friends of mine, a part of Samuel's grief is what some of us are going through in this transition. It is the fear of a fresh start. And see, some of us fear a fresh start. Why? Because we've invested so much in what was that we're not sure if we got strength for what shall come to pass. Are y'all hearing me today, saints? In other words, there's a part of Samuel that's saying, we, I've given too much for us to just discard him. There is a part of Samuel that's looking at what God is saying and saying, no, we got to fix him. We've got to redeem him. Listen, we can't allow all of my investments into this person to go to waste. And see, a part of what is happening is that there is a certain blurring of the lines. You see, Samuel's loyalty was supposed to be to the throne, not the one that sat on it. But because Samuel helped develop the one on the throne, he's got a little conflict about where his loyalty is supposed to be. And because he's so loyal to a personality, he's willing to keep investing in a mistake. Oh, y'all not hearing me today. You see, I need you to get, saints, that the human parts of Saul, wants, Samuel wants to redeem Saul. He's saying, man, we got to give Saul another chance. He's saying we've got to fix Saul. In other words, there is a frustrating element to them because he's saying, I can't believe I gave this many years to the wrong person. I can't believe I've been praying all this time for the wrong one. I can't believe I've wasted this much stress over the wrong thing. And there is a part of all of his investment that won't even allow him to see Saul as a mistake. Are y'all hearing me today, saints? Uh, let me ask the question. Have any of us ever made some mistakes? Oh, y'all spiritual today, Oakwood, but come on and tell the truth. 
Uh, I, I know that all things work together for the good of them that love God, and, and God made it work out for your good. But let's just tell the truth that if we had done some things a little differently, we would have saved some headache and some heartache and some stress along the way. Come on and say amen today, church. Listen, all of us make mistakes. The truth is that some of us are still living out some of the consequences of some mistakes. The truth is that it was a mistake for you to remarry so quickly. It it was a mistake for you to sign the divorce papers so quick. It was a mistake for you to take that job. It was a mistake for you to relocate. How many of us know that some of us are living in some mistakes? Some of us are driving some mistakes. Some of us are wearing some mistakes. Some of us are sitting next to some mistakes. Some of us are even raising some, oh, y'all mighty quiet, Come on, come on, come on and stay with me today, church. <laughs> and because we've given so much to it, it makes it hard for us to walk away from it. In other words, you can't believe you gave that much energy to a mistake and you put that much stress into a mistake. And what God is needing you to understand is that you can't be loyal to your mistakes. Why? See, the reason we keep investing in a mistake is because we're ashamed to give up on all that we've given to it. But what you ought to fear is not how much you've given in the past you ought to fear about what running out for what you have in the future. In other words, I need you to understand this, friends of mine. The reason some of us can't give to what is is because we've invested so much in what was. See, the reason you can't invest in a mistake is that you'll never get a return on that investment. Like, like, do I have a witness today that a mistake won't ever get tired of taking? Listen, I need you to get that mistakes don't never get full. Mistakes never become content. Mistakes are never satisfied. Mistakes are never complete. A mistake, mistake is going to take and take and take until you ain't got nothing to give to what God has for you in the future. Are y'all hearing me today, saints? And there are some of us that are afraid of beginning a fresh start. There are some of us that are afraid of starting over again. But I need you to understand understand that at some point you've got to cut ties with what was and be willing to start over with what God has. Are y'all hearing me today, saints? Okay, okay. Like I, I remember probably about two years ago before the pandemic uh, uh, at my previous church, we, we, got, we had a little competition. It was a pastoral staff baking competition. Now, now, I need y'all to understand this, that it was a time thing. It was online, and, and I was a little bit under pressure because people came in person to actually see this event. And I need you to know that we were all in a competition to bake some cupcakes. But, but as I'm rushing through the ingredients, it called for me to put in a cup of flour and a teaspoon of baking soda. But somewhere I got my directions mixed up. And instead of putting in a cup of flour, I put in a cup of baking soda. Pray with the pastor today. And, and, and I need you to know that now I'm, I'm looking in the oven and, and my cupcakes are bubbling like a volcano. And, and see, now I have made a mistake, but now I'm so far into it that I ain't got time to start over so that when it comes out of the oven, instead of starting over with my state mistake, I put frosting on the mistake and I put sprinkles on the mistake and I put syrup on the mistake, but it still tasted like dog food because how many of us know you can't never perfect a mistake? Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today, church? And at some point, you got to be willing to start over with God than to keep being loyal to your flesh. Are y'all hearing me today? Third thing this teaches, friends of mine, is that we've got to be careful how we live because sometimes the things that we may dodge might land on our children. Now, it's going to get a little quiet right up in here. 
And I should tell you from the beginning that mincing words is not my thing. So, so God says to Samuel, he says, go down to Jesse's house. And he says, I'm going to anoint a king that has my heart this time. Now, I need you to understand what the judgment against Saul actually is. Are y'all still with me, church? Because he says, I have rejected Saul from being king over Israel. But have you ever noticed that even though Saul has been rejected, that Saul remains on the throne for another 15 years, even after David is anointed? And so I need you to be clear on this, that the judgment against Saul was not an immediate impeachment. It was a projection against his household. In other words, the rejection of Saul didn't mean that he would have to immediately give up the throne. What it means is that his kids would never have access to it. And see, I need you to get how crippling this judgment actually is because you realize that 42 generations after David, there came another king named Jesus who would save us from our sins. And the judgment of Saul is that his kids are disconnected from the lineage of Jesus. Mm. In other words, I need y'all to understand that historically Saul is the first king of Israel. But in Jewish lore and celebration, it is as if it actually started with David. So when they looked at Jesus and said, son of David, descendant of David, maybe that should have read son or descendant of Saul. And, and are y'all hearing what I'm saying? That because of the daddy's sins... The kids would be around the kingdom, but guess what? They would never have access to it. And what I'm saying today, friends of mine, is that sometimes we've got to be careful about our spiritual indifference as we have grown up in church and around religious things because sometimes our indifference doesn't affect us. Sometimes it'll land on and affect our children. Oh, I knew it was going to get a little quiet in here. But, but see, I need you to understand, friends of mine, that, that how many of us can say we came up in an imperfect religious tradition? But I need you to understand that even though it was imperfect, God still worked through an imperfect tradition to get you connected to a perfect Savior. But sometimes we are so down on the tradition that we bail out on the Jesus of the tradition. Oh, y'all are hearing me today, saints. In other words, so what we do is we do stuff like this. Because religion was a requirement for us, we make it optional for them. Because we had to get up early in the morning and have worship and sing hymns, now there is no family altar in our house. Be because we weren't allowed to wear this and go there, now we don't even teach modesty or give them a filter about where they ought to go. Okay, since you're mad, let me stay here. Because we had a bad experience in church school, we put our kids under the influence of public. I knew it was going to get a little quiet up in here. In other words, because somebody beat you up with the spirit of prophecy. We won't even open up and read the spirit of prophecy because somebody was so rigid with how they presented the Sabbath, we don't even give our kids a concept of the Sabbath. And see, the problem with the contemporary church is we've raised a group of educated, spiritually knuckleheaded folk who know sports, they know piano, they know music, they know literature, they know Roblox, but they don't know the Lord. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today, church? And even though it was not perfect for you, you had enough to be able to find your way back to Jesus. But because they ain't got no foundation, when life gets hard, it's going to swallow them up whole because we've not given them the tools to be able to survive. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today, church? See, I need you to get 
that even though it wasn't right, you were able to get close enough to the kingdom. But because you're reacting to a bad experience, they don't even know nothing about the kingdom. And see, what I'm saying to us today, friends, the problem with some of us is that our religion is a reaction and not a response. Okay, let me stay in it. Because how many of us understand that worship is supposed to be a response to his goodness, not a reaction to their craziness? Mm. See, I need you to understand your religion is too reactionary because whenever your practice is a reaction, it's going to always be extreme. It's going to always go too far left. It's going to always be volatile, and it'll never satisfy because it's not rooted in Jesus. And see, the problem to a certain extent is that we've thrown out the baby with the bath water. You know, it's crazy because like you're in my house. You're one of those folks. I know I got some relatives out here. I, after a while, I just, I just can't stand clutter in the house. Am I related to anybody here today? I mean, like at some point, like if I've been looking at it too long in the garage or in a closet, like that's going to get a point where I'm going to look at it and I'm going to get so annoyed by it that I'm just going to start dragging boxes by the side of the road and I ain't going to even look to see what's inside. In other words, I'm like, if we ain't opened this box in six years, do I have a witness out there? We can put it by the road and it'll be straight. Are y'all hearing me, saints? But the tension in the house is that sometimes I'll put the box by the side of the road. But then I'll look out and I'll see my wife by the side of the road. And she'll be looking through the boxes. And, and, and every now and then she'll come back inside with stuff in her hands. And I'm like, baby, why are you bringing the junk I put out back inside of the house? And see, one thing she's trying to help me to understand, she says, be careful what you throw away. Because she opened her hands and she said, you've thrown away our wedding video, photo albums, and things that still have value. And she's trying to help me to get that just in order to declutter, you just get rid of what we don't need, but you keep the things that still have value. In other words, you've got to filter through the trash and keep the stuff that still got value. Do I have a witness in the room today that family worship still has value? that coming to church still has value, that prayer meeting still has value, that fellowship, it still has value, that church school done right still has value, that friendships in church still has value, that the spirit of prophecy still has value. Don't throw away the treasure just to get rid of the trash. Are y'all hearing me today, saints? And see, the problem is you blurred everything together and you don't know the difference between the, the message of Adventism and the culture of Adventism. How many of us know we can get rid of the culture, but we got to keep the message? Are y'all hearing me today, saints? So the word says to us here in verse number six, the Bible says, so it was when they came, that he looked at Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed. No, he was sure about that thing. He was convinced. Did y'all see this? this? No, this ain't no average joke. This is the prophet of God who said, surely this must be the Lord's anointed before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't look at his appearance or his physical stature. Because I've refused him. For the Lord doesn't see as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Third thing this teaches us, friends of mine, is that sometimes looks can be deceiving. <laughs> you see, you know what this text, what you just read, you know what it teaches us? It shows us why we got to depend on God for everything. You know what it shows us? is that none of us have innate discernment. All of your discernment has to be borrowed from the Holy Spirit. 
like what you just read, not by just some average person, but by the near fatal mistake of the prophet of God, it shows us why Proverbs says there is a way that seems right unto a man. But the end is a way of death. It's showing us why you can't trust. Are y'all still with me, church? Shows, watch this, young people, why you can't trust your own judgment. Now, I don't really know exactly how this thing plays out. So God says, Samuel, I want you to go down to, D to Jesse's house, and I want you to anoint a son, one of Jesse's sons. And it's crazy because the prophet Samuel goes down to, to the town of Bethlehem, and, and Jesse functions as like a city alderman or some type of sheik. And when they greet Samuel, they are initially afraid because they think that he has come to bring judgment of some sort upon the city of Bethlehem. But Samuel makes it clear that I've come in peace. He says, I've come to participate and sacrifice. Bring your seven sons that we might be able to sacrifice with one another. And I see that, that, that Jesse is in my mind's eye. He notices that Samuel has the horn of oil with him. And he knows that something unique is about to go down. And I don't know exactly how it goes down, but Jesse brings in, he's strapping young men, and they literally parade themselves before the prophet like models hoping to be chosen from a catwalk. And I'm not sure if Eliab comes in first. I'm not sure if he comes in second. But as soon as the prophet lays eyes on Eliab, he is convinced that between his build and his stature and his battle scars, he is convinced that this must be the Lord's anointing. And the voice of God comes immediately from heaven saying, mankind, I don't see like you see. I don't value what you value. I don't care about the things you care about. He says, your problem is that you look on the outward appearance. You're worried about how he's built and you're worried about his experience and you're worried about his degrees. You're looking on the outward appearance, but I've got one criteria. I want a man that's going to have a heart after mine. And see, friends of mine, I need you to see what it was that almost caused the prophet to err in such a fatally uh, flawed way. In fact, look here at Patriarchs and Prophets 638. I want you to see what it was that called the prophet to skew the wrong direction. Stay with me, church. Uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, put it up here on the screen. I want you to see what she says. This is why uh, Samuel messed up, because when he saw Eliab, it stirred some echoes. See, what was the problem? Eliab was the eldest and more nearly resembled Saul. Oh, y'all didn't catch it. When he sees him, he sees a semblance of Saul for stature and beauty than the others. His calmly futures, features and finely developed form attracted the attention of the prophet. And as Samuel looked upon his princely bearing, he thought, this indeed is the man whom God has chosen as a successor to Saul. And he waited for the divine sanction that he might anoint him. But Jehovah did not look upon the outward appearance. Watch this. Eliab did not fear the Lord. Had he had been called to the throne. He would have been proud and exacting ruler. The Lord's word to Samuel was look not on his countenance nor on the height of his stature because I have refused him. The Lord does not see as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance but God looks on the heart. Did y'all catch it church? Okay. In other words what almost messed him up is that when he saw Eliab he saw Saul. <laughs> in other words, his princely stature, his wonderful be I mean, did you notice what he literally says when he just, like, he literally judges it by the way he looks. He literally makes a spiritual decision based upon a physical impression. 
And see, I need you to understand the issue at work here is that this is kind of how Samuel wanted his leader to look. This is how he wanted his leader to act. This is how he wanted his leader to project. In fact, the one outstanding trait about Saul is that Saul stood a foot taller than everybody else in the land of Israel. In other words, what almost messed up the prophet was that Eliab was his type. Okay. In, in other words, because when he saw Eliab, he saw Saul, he, he was about to choose him because Eliab was his type. Oh, y'all didn't get it yet. In other words, he was about to go from bad to worse because he was loyal to his type. Okay, y'all not here. Uh, he was going to go from frying pan into fire because Eliab was his type. Uh, he was about to relive the same sorrow because Eliab was his type. And I need us to understand that we all have a certain type that we can be loyal to. But I need you to understand, my friends, that sanctification never takes place until you're more loyal to God's plan than you are to your type. Okay. Because all of us got a type. Come on and say amen. Some of us have a type of friend. And you don't want to admit it, but some of us have literally become attracted to chaos and drama. And because you're one of those people that need to be needed, you literally draw in people who are takers by nature. And because that's your type, you always find yourself being overwhelmed and undervalued and abused because folk take more than they give. But at some point, you've got to modify your type. I'm praying that God will bless somebody to stop drawing in deficits and start pulling in some surpluses. Are y'all hearing me today, church? I mean, the real truth is we all got, we all got a type. Like, 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 just like the prophet, like some of us see Jesus in her build. We think curves equal character. Y'all, y'all not with me today. Sometimes we, we see Jesus in his stature. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And see, it's crazy because you keep experiencing the same heartache because you keep choosing the same person. You see, the only thing that's changed in our relationship history are the names because we're so committed to our type. Our health is compromised because we are committed to a certain type of food. Well, am I in an Adventist church today still? I mean, we believe in health. Come on and say amen. I mean, let's just tell the truth. Rutabagas ain't nobody's type. Come on and say amen. It's, it's acquired. The Lord has got to help us in that direction. But we all got a type of food. Our, our type is greasy and it's cheesy and it's sweet and it's fried. It ain't never baked. Come on and say amen. Krispy Kreme is your type and Dairy Queen is your type and Dunkin' Donuts is your type. But how many of us know that there is no pill and no medicine and no surgery that will heal you until you change your type? So, so all of us have a type. We got a type of car, and there's a type of clothes, and there's types of friends, and many in church have a type of pastor. And some of y'all mad in here today because the conference didn't send y'all y'all type. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. Oh, I'm going to stand in it right here if I got to stand all by myself. And y'all mad because the conference didn't send your type. And see, the problem is we create characteristics that's based on our preferences and not on the Word of God. So y'all roll out your list of your wants and demands. In other words, I want a preacher that don't get too loud. And I want a preacher that's going to preach prophecy. You saying, I want a preacher that's going to preach love. You saying, I want a preacher that's going to preach doctrine. You're saying, I want a preacher that's only going to sing hymns. And what you mean is I want a preacher that I can control. And, and what I need somebody to know is that I might not be your type. And, and can I just announce on day number one that it is not my goal to audition for your approval. I'm at a place in my life where I'm just trying to hear Jesus say, well done, 
good and faithful servant. Is there anybody that can celebrate that you ain't everybody's type? You ain't everybody's cup of tea. In fact, if I was your type, it would mean something is wrong with me. So I'm glad that I ain't your type. I'm glad I don't fit into your box. You might always want a preacher who sings and one that always wears a suit. I might not be your type, but guess what? I'm his type. Are y'all hearing the word today? And don't come with a list of types for the first lady. She ain't gotta sing. She ain't gotta do women's ministry. She ain't gotta be good with the kids. She ain't gotta be your type. All that matters is that she's my type. Don't give me no box. Don't come with your criteria. Don't come with your qualifications. I'm living for the approval of one. And as long as Jesus says I'm all right, then guess what? It's going to be all right. Are y'all hearing the word today, saints? Last thing. And let me just say this. Friends, it's not wrong to have a preference. But see, the problem with preference, saints, is that preference is always rooted in something you've already seen. See, the problem with preference is that it's connected to something you've already experienced. And see, we love to quote Ephesians 3.20 that says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ask or think. But God can't do more than you can ask or think if you're going to limit him to how you've always thought about it. And see, I need somebody to understand is that at some point your preference becomes your prison. Because you'll only roll with God as far as your familiarity. And see, and this is why young people in the balcony, hear me on this. This is why, brothers, you might need to edit your type. See, some of y'all then watch so much pornography that you don't even see godliness is sexy no more. But how many of us know the sexiest woman ain't just the one that gets down on her knees in a movie. It's the one that gets on her knees in a war room and calls on the name. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? See, the problem is too many of our girls have been mentored by the thug life culture. So you got this attraction for the thug or the bad boy. But see, I need you to understand the one thing about a thug is that thug are like locusts. They're only loyal to the field when it's full. In other words, while they are eating here, they got their eye on the next field so they can transition there as soon as you ain't got nuts to give. And I need you to know that when they move on, they ain't trying to hurt your feelings. That's just their nature. Oh, and we got these stupid qualifications. You want a spiritual stuff thug that's emotionally aware, that likes to talk, and is going to treat you like a queen. That ain't what thugs do. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Like a, a thug ain't got no husband characteristics. No thug ain't going to be up at 3 in the morning rocking with the baby so you can sleep late at night. The thug ain't going to rub your feet when you're tired. The thug ain't going to be there to hold you down in prayer. You're looking at the spiritual dude like he's corny. The problem ain't with him. The problem is you got a jacked up, messed up type. And you better let God do some rearranging. Can y'all say amen? Last thing, this teacher's friends of mine, I'm almost done. Is this, is that you don't have to choose from visible options. 
No, no, let me say it again. You don't have to choose just from the visible options. Can I say this? Never settle for what you see. You got to wait based on what you sense. <laughs> because, see, everything that's visible, you shouldn't deem it as accessible. Wait, what do you mean, Pastor? So Samuel is listening, not just with his physical ear, but with his spiritual ears. Y'all still with me, church? I'm almost done. Like, stay with me for just, just a few more minutes. He's listening with his, his spiritual ears at this point. Because, see, I need you to understand where, where the ambiguity is in the situation. Because when God sent him to Jesse's house, he just sent him with a mission. He didn't send him with a name. He, he just said, it's one of Jesse's sons. And understand that like, man, that there is this literally, there is literally an audition for Samuel's approval as like, man, Eliab comes and God says he's not the one. And Shammah comes and God says he's not the one. And Abinadab comes and he's not the one. And all of the visible options stroll before Samuel. And see, there is something about Samuel. There is, there is a tension. I need you to get that. There is a frustration in the spirit. Like, that there is a disconnect because he knows that God said it is one of Jesse's sons, but yet God has said no to all of the options that have revealed themselves. And I need you to get how it is that Dan, uh, Samuel uh, came to this conclusion that if it's not of the ones that's visible... God must have another option that's available. Okay. Oh, yeah. In other words, it, it's not an option that's visible, but God must have another one that is available. And see, what I need somebody to understand is that you don't need to always settle for the first visible option. <sighs> see, I like how Samuel processes this thing. He's saying, something ain't right, but I've run out of options, but I'll never choose from bad options. Mm. I'm going to be patient, and I'm going to be still until the right option appears. So, so Samuel says, uh, is this all the churn? Because God didn't say it, no. Can I say churn at Oakwood? Because <laughs> God has said no to all of these. And Jesse says, well, since you asked, I didn't even think he was worth presenting. Because he's the youngest son. He the smallest one. He ain't never been to battle. I just leave him out there with the sheep. And Samuel says, go get him. But notice what the text says. The text says, Samuel says, we will not sit down until we've seen all the options. Oh. In other words, he's saying we won't get comfortable until we've seen all the options. We're not going to rest until we've seen all the options. Church, we shouldn't settle until we've seen all the options. Young folk, you shouldn't get comfortable until you've seen all of the options. Because sometimes just because all the visible options are bad, it doesn't mean that God doesn't have another option somewhere or tucked away. And it has been hidden and preserved by God for a specific time and a specific season in your life. And I guess what I want to close by saying is to somebody today that you don't have to settle just for the visible option. In other words, young person, you ain't got to say yes to the first brother that proposes. God might have another option. You ain't got to accept the first grad school that accepts you in. God might have another option. You don't have to embrace the first job that someone offers. God may have another option. Guess what? You ain't got to settle for reading the book when God has given you power to write the book. 
You ain't got to settle for listening mu for music if God has given you the ability to write the music. You ain't got to settle for being a live-in girlfriend if God has ordained you to be somebody's wife. You ain't got to settle for being an employee when God has called you to own or run the business. Is there anybody that's made up in your mind that I ain't got to settle no more? Are you at a place in your life where you ain't choosing from the bottom of the barrel? You ain't gonna eat no more leftovers. Is there anybody that knows you ain't gotta share your man or your woman with nobody else? I'm looking for somebody that's just in a place in your life where you gotta say, Lord, I want a little bit more. Is there anybody saying, I want a little more, Jesus? You're saying, I'm tired of average. I'm tired of ordinary. I'm tired of just getting by. I'm tired of living from hand to mouth. I'm tired of barely making it till the check comes. Is there anybody that's sick and tired of just being complacent? You understand the promise of God where Jesus says, I have come that they might have life and life more abundantly. Is there anybody that believes that you're the head and not the tail, that you're above and not beneath, that you're a lender and not a borrower. Is there anybody that knows that God wants you to be blessed in the city? You ought to be blessed in the field. You ought to be blessed when you come. You ought to be blessed when you go. That God wants to bless your health. That I don't want my children to be C students. I want them to be mighty in the land. I want them to call fire from heaven. I want them to cast demons out. Is there a church that's tired of average? You got tired of just being full on Sabbath. But maybe we ought to start a second service that we can reach another generation. Is there anybody that knows like David that I was young, but now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging after bread. I don't have to settle. God wants more for me. God has more for you. And if you believe it, put your hands together and give the Lord a praise. Give him glory, give him honor, because God has great plans for you, his children. And God is simply trying to get us to a place where we have enough faith and trust in God where we won't just say yes to everything that we can see, but that we'll be still long enough and say, God, if you say not that job or not that opportunity, and, and even if all the doors are closed in front of you, and you're like, Lord, all the doors close. If God closes those doors, it's cause the Ruah breath of God, the Spirit is gonna push another door open up. <laughs> young brother, young sister, I need you to know, I don't care how many grad schools have said no to you, what God has for you, it is for you. He opens up doors that no man can shut. And just because it's not visible, it doesn't mean that God hadn't made it available. And God wants you to get to a place where you'll be still, where you'll wait on him and say, Lord, I trust you enough to operate outside of my senses and I'll wait until you say yes. I'll wait till you confirm. It may look like there ain't nothing else for me, but the word of God to somebody today is that looks can be deceiving. Praise team is going to minister in a word of song. I'm going to come back and make one last appeal. God didn't give me that gift of singing, so come on up, minister in this song. And as you're seated, as you meditate on this, we'll come back and ask you to make a decision for Jesus Christ. I'm not going back. I'm moving ahead. I'm here to declare to you my past is over in you. All things are made new, surrender my life to Christ, I'm moving, moving forward, oh, 
What a moment you have brought me through Such a freedom I have found in you You're the healer, you make all things new Yeah, 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 yeah Let's sing that together, I'm not, I'm not going back I'm moving, I'm moving Now you're standing to your feet as we prepare to close the service. We know that the hour is late. But there's somebody that needs to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ today. The word of the song says, at some point, you got to stop looking back. You got to start moving ahead. And there is somebody that has been a slave to who you were for way too long. You have this past, these errors that you've made. And I need you to know that you should not be fooled by the shirts and the ties and the positions that are, are in this place. We've all made those same mistakes. So I, I need you to know that all you're looking at right here on this platform, all I am is just an epistle of divine grace. I'm just a proof that God can take anybody and do something special with it. And if you're here today in the balcony, young person, you're on the floor, you want to make it up in your mind this fourth Sabbath of the new year that you're not looking back, but you want to go all the way in a saved, committed relationship with Jesus Christ for the boon of being baptized or maybe you need to come back to Christ through rededication. If you're here today and the Spirit of God has moved upon your heart, God is saying that you got to stop being loyal to your mistakes 
And you've made some mistakes with your friend circle. You've made some mistakes with your influences. You've made some mistakes with the individuals that you've lended your heart to. And God is saying, I want you to come to a place. I want you to come to this moment, this hour, where, where you stop investing in what was hurting you. And I need you to make an attachment to the God who is going to help you. And so if you're here today and the Spirit of God is moving upon your heart, you want to go all the way in a safe relationship with him, I invite you to just slip out of your aisle. Come on down to the front. Give me your hand and give Jesus Christ your heart. Is there somebody today you want to say yes to the Lord? You want to give him your life. You want to walk in his ways and his direction. You want to go all the way to say, I want to be baptized. I want to be rededicated. I, I, or maybe you're just saying, I sense God about to do something at Oakwood and spiritually as it relates to churches. I, I've been drifting, but I've not been calling any place home. And you want to make it up in your mind. You want to be a part of the Oakwood University Church. I invite you to come. God bless you. Praise God for you, brother. Is there somebody else today? You say, I want to join through baptism. I want to come through uh, rededication. I want to get in some Bible studies. Or maybe you want to transfer and become a member of this body of Christ. If you're here today, just raise your hand. Or maybe you can walk down the aisle, but we want to get you in a saved relationship with Jesus. Come on down, sister. We'll wait for you. Is there somebody else that wants to say yes to Jesus Christ? You want to commit yourself to him. And I know a larger portion of our audience is online. And there are a number of you. Maybe you're in Huntsville. Maybe you're in another place. I wanted you to just look, click on the tab in the comments that says ways to connect, ways to connect. And there you can verify your decision to be baptized or to begin some Bible studies to go all the way with Jesus Christ. So whether you're in person or whether you're online, this is the day, this is your hour to say yes to Jesus Christ. See some more young people coming, won't you come? Put your hands together, cheer them on to Jesus, cheer them on to Jesus. God bless you. God bless you, my friend. God bless you, little sisters. Is there somebody else? You want to say yes to Jesus Christ? Whether you're in the building, in the, on the floor, in the balcony, you want to go all the way with him. You want to say, I'm, I'm not looking back. I'm moving ahead. There, there is somebody, a part of your healing is going to happen when you stop weeping over where God was or the potential of a thing that never came to pass. And you just recognize where God is moving in this moment and time in your life. There's somebody, God is saying, stop weeping over what was so you can see where God is. God bless you, brother. Thank you for making that decision. It's the best decision you will ever, ever make. Is there somebody else today? Maybe you've never been baptized. I need you to know all, all baptism is, it's an, it's an outward symbol. When you see somebody go down in the water, all that means is, is I'm, I'm going into what we call the watery grave. All that means, that symbol means I'm saying, I'm, I'm, being, I'm, I'm dying to an old life. And when I come up out of the water, I come freed from the old life and I begin a new life in Jesus. And so if you're here today and the Spirit is moving upon your heart, please don't harden your heart. Don't say later. Don't say tomorrow. Because that's not promised to anybody. If the last two years have taught us anything, it's that tomorrow is not promised. I know the hour is late, and I'm not going to make a habit of keeping you this long. This is an outlier of a service. But if you're online, you didn't get to this service by happenstance. God didn't have you watching by chance. There's nothing ra random about this moment. You've never been baptized. Or maybe... In an attempt to declutter, you threw out the things that still had value in order to get rid of the things that no longer served you. And God is saying, guess what? Bible study still has value. Church still has value. Family worship still has value. Listen, your worship has to get to a place where it's a response to his goodness, not your church culture's fallenness. And it's time for you to respond and stop reacting. Stop reacting to your hurt. Start responding to his goodness. There's a difference between the culture of the church and the message of the church. And you got to be able to discern the difference between the two. I'm going to pray in a minute. So if you're online, will you say yes? 
you're in the balcony, we'll give you a last, last few minutes. If you're on the floor, you can come. We'll still hold the doors of the church open so you can say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on down. Doors of the church are open. Come on in. We'll receive you. More importantly, he'll receive you. He'll receive you right now. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Father, we're grateful that your word is a lamp unto our feet and it's a light unto our path. Father, we acknowledge today that we don't know what to do. We don't know our right hand from our lefts. Too often we judge situations and people and circumstances solely based upon how it looks. But Father, I pray that you would help us to get to a place where we don't trust common sense or conventional thinking. That we stop functioning according to hunches and we go according to the Holy Spirit that we stop trusting our gut and start trusting our God. We're learning that looks can be deceiving. And so, Father, I'm asking in a very special way that as you have joined my family to this church family, that you would cause something to detonate, that you would create a merger in mission, in spirit, and in essence. I pray, dear God, in the name of Jesus, that you would help us to be part of a, a, a revival in the church, a rebuild of sorts as we emerge from this pandemic. I pray that the church would not be compromised by what is happening in the world, but the same way it grew in the midst of persecution, I pray that you would still cause it to grow in the midst of a pandemic. Father, I pray in a special way that on this campus that young men and young women, boys and girls, that, that things spiritually would crystallize, that values would be cemented, that they would start walking with Jesus in a way that they would never, ever repent from. May it start here. May it start now. Father, I pray for your blessing over this university and its leadership. I pray to God that you would cause it to prosper in the land. I pray to God that you would make it a school of great renown as the praises of Jesus are constantly given and shine forth because of what you have done. Lord, would you be with Oakwood Academy that it will continue to flourish in ways and in, and, 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 and in phases that we never even thought possible. I pray that as a church, we would be impactful in community, that we would be impactful in city that we would not be insulated and unto ourselves, but may we be a vine that branches off into every part of the Tennessee Valley, making Jesus Christ known. So Lord, I thank you for this church's history. And it is our history that gives us confidence about the future. But as a people, help us to get to the place where we don't just celebrate history but help us to come together and make some history. So Lord, would you bless us, keep us, anoint us for your divine purpose, we pray. In the name of Jesus, let God's redeemed people say together, amen and amen. If you love him, put your hands together for Jesus Christ one more time. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. So listen, family, I'm so glad to be here with you. I look forward to greeting you there in the hallway, but while we're there, even in your, your, your pews, we're going to be touchless. We're going to do air pounds and air hugs. We are still in the midst of a pandemic. Am I telling the truth? So even though we are covered by God, we want you to exercise safety and the needed precautions. May God bless you. I look forward to seeing you again next week. Leaders of the Oakwood University Church, I'll be looking for individual and group appointments with you so that we can begin debriefing and charting our path forward together. May God rest, richly bless you as you continue in your Sabbath experience. Praise the Lord. We want to thank you, Pastor Snell, for those words and for allowing the Lord to use you today. I'm going to say this personally. Uh, I don't know if you know what you preach today, Pastor Snell, but your words have had a profound effect on even myself, so I, I appreciate it. If you could bow your heads for, for the benediction. Our great and mighty God, we thank you for this opportunity to come together on your holy Sabbath day. We thank you that by some working of your spirit, that through the foolishness of preaching, we could be brought face to face with the throne of our God. We thank you for the challenge that was issued today. We pray that you'll give us the face to accept it. 
Now unto him who is the only great God, unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, than all we can ever ask or think, unto him that can blow our minds if we would just give him the chance. To him, I pray, he give you the ability to trust him, to leave the things that he has not anointed and to follow him. God, I pray as we leave here that you will give us the ability to have faith in you, to hold on to you more than anything else. And as the preacher says, not just for our good, but because someone else's life is at stake. Let that spirit empower you as you leave this place, not for our sake, but for the sake of the, our God, for the sake of his son's kingdom in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have mercy. Have mercy. <laughs> what about that? Wow. Listen, th there's a text that says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us, let us go, go into the house of the Lord. And I'm so glad that I was in this house today. It Man, powerful, we had such a powerful, powerful, experience. powerful experience. You know, I was sitting here thinking, Pastor, that if we had to unpack this day or mm -hmm. unpack this message, mm -hmm. It would be a full set of Toomey luggage. <laughs> <laughs> Toomey, right? Uh, Toomey, a full set of Toomey. And there were so many, so many wonderful high points in, in this, this day of, of excitement and yes. joy and exuberation. Yeah. And I just, I, I'm thrilled and I hope that it was conveyed to you. Mm -hmm our viewing audience. I hope that you were able to feel the energy that we experienced here today. Absolutely, absolutely. I know for a while, you know, we've been in a virtual setting. I know for a while we haven't been able to, to gather, but just sensing the people in the room and, and spirit, uh, uh, um, uh, mingling with spirit and just the, the oneness of the occasion and why we're here. And I know that the Holy Spirit was here with us. I know that the presence of God was with us. And we had a high day in Zion. Indeed we did. You know, as I sat here, I had a wonderful vantage point from which I was able to participate mm -hmm. in the service. And I was watching this one woman in particular. And I don't think she put her hands down once. Oh, wow. I think when she, wow. she's yeah. got, she's, she yeah. built muscles today because she had her hands <laughs> upstre uh, outstretched all all through the service, and I think that just communicates yes. the feeling of what was happening today. Yeah, yeah. Praise, a lot of praise. Amen. So listen, those of you who are watching um, on and have been watching our service, just go ahead and, and start to uh, put in the chat. Uh, just comment on your experience, you know, even just from the outside, the, you know, the blessings that you received or, or one word or a thought or, or even maybe it was a sentence or something that spoke to you and that convicted you and that helped you. And, and so go ahead and connect with us. Because we're looking at the chat now because we really do want to um, have an opportunity to fellowship with you, mm -hmm. our online congregation, as it, as it were. Yes. And so we're looking at the chat. And if you have something you want to share, we'd be happy to read it. Um, I see a lot of congratulatory remarks and a lot of thanksgiving for Pastor Snell, a lot of blessings yes. for Pastor Snell. A lot of people are saying, moving ahead in Jesus' name. Amen. And that's the whole the crux of today's whole sermon yes. was how to move forward without being hung up on things of the past. Exactly. And exactly. how uh, when God has a divine purpose for you, you can't move forward while looking back. Yes, yes. You have to let go of the past in order to, to move forward. Now, now, Linda, there's a number of individuals who are on our chat and some familiar names, you know, even though I haven't necessarily met, met you all. But uh, uh, some familiar names in the chat in terms of um, uh, uh, Nick Nack Paddywhack. I know that she, uh, or that individual, I'm assuming it's a she. Yes. But that individual has, has been joining us. I know Marva Mortley. I know we went to school together, Marvy. Beautiful. Marva. It's, um, you know, Keys Universe. Um, you know, I know that you've been watching us faithfully, and I know you put in the chat, you know, I've been truly blessed, and you took notes. I, I, I believe all of us took notes. Yes, we did. I was Linda. taking a lot of mental notes yes. as well, especially when the pastor began talking about how uh, we lay hold to our mistakes mm -hmm. and we hold on to them and we don't want to let them go. And then when we make a mistake, we try to decorate it so that it doesn't feel like a mistake. Yes. He stepped on my toes. It's a good <laughs> thing I had on flat shoes today. Um, but, but maybe some of you want to share what you received from the message today. Mm -hmm. uh, was it, 
a divine calling to let go of some things? Are there some areas in your life that you want to now revisit to see how you can change them? I, I noticed that when uh, Pastor Snell was talking about how in his house when he was growing up, when his parents would close their door, yes. it would create a draft yes. Yes. and it would open their doors. God is, then he started talking about how God may close some doors mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in order that others may open. What are some of the doors that you're hoping God will open in yes. your life moving forward? And some of the doors that need to be closed. That's key. That's key. In order for new doors to open. I see that Daphne Francis said, yes, Lord, may God give us another option. God, God may have another option. Yes. And um, someone else said here, um, praising God uh, for praise the Lord, praising God for the message, the powerful message. Uh, there was one that really um, encouraged me, though, that I read just a few moments ago. Okay. Um, and I, I'm looking for it now. Someone said, Lydia Rigby said, I'm moving ahead in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Because that's the way to move ahead. Yes. I'm moving ahead in Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor. Just a lot of hope being expressed, um, a lot of talk about the anointing of God. And mm -hmm. my hope is that wherever you are, yeah. uh, that you heard something today that is going to give you that encouragement mm -hmm. to move, to step out, to move forward. It's a new year. And so often we make all these New Year's resolutions. Yes. And today we're not making New Year's resolutions. We're making promises and commitments to yes. God. And mm -hmm. he's going to enable us to be able to keep them. Speaking of promises, um, Anthony Brown and oh, Have my. Mercy. Anthony my. Brown and Group Therapy, they ministered to my soul. And, and, and two of the songs that they sang, especially, you know, the, the new one that he talks about still, in spite of what I've done, mm -hmm. in spite of who I am, still. in spite of our unfaithfulness, God loves me Still. Still. That's beautiful. And you know what I loved about uh, the ministry of group therapy and Anthony Brown was that they gave us some new stuff mm -hmm, that we could mm -hmm. uh, be encouraged by, but then he touched on some of the old. I, yeah. I, was, I was reading some messages from my family, my nephew Frederick and my daughter Brooke, and they were saying, we wanted to hear old songs, and then they finally heard a couple of old <laughs> songs. So I thank God that he gave yes. us something new, but <laughs> so he also so gave us a little bit of the old so that we would know the words. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so the other thing is the other song, which, you know, we know and we love, um, You Thought I Was Worth oh, Saving. Oh, Saving. Listen. Um, you Thought I Was the, To Die you know, For. Those of you who are watching, understand it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done, Amen. Linda. Amen. It doesn't matter what your experience is. God loves you. And he thought that you were worth saving, so he gave his life for you. Oh, that's beautiful. And all he wants you to do beautiful. is just say, Lord, I accept. So listen, if, if, if you hear the Spirit of God speaking to you, if you feel the presence of God even now, just put in the chat, Lord, I accept. Lord, I accept. Just connect with us. O-U-C uh, 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 S-D-A forward slash connect. And we want to pray with you. Maybe you have a prayer request. Maybe there's something that you're asking God to do for you. We want to connect with you. We want to pray with you. Our prayer team, we have such a wonderful prayer team and here at power. the Oak Ridge. There's power yes. in prayer. Yes, yes. And um, the, the Bible encourages us by telling us whatsoever things you have need of, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whatever it is, yes. whatever you have yeah. need of, you ask of God. Amen. That's prayer. That's the beginning of stepping out in faith. Someone said, God, please open the door to my new home. Amen. Um, and, Amen. And our prayer is that whatever it is that you came here searching for today, whatever yes. longing yeah. there may be yeah. in your life, that you heard something that will give you the encouragement to know God cares. I love what you said, Pastor Goodrich, when you said, he thought I was to die for. Yes. You need to know your self-worth, your value to yes. God. Yes. God cares so much that he was willing to give his life in exchange for yours. That should let you know your value. Amen. Amen. We will, in, in fact, even now, let me just pause and pray. Father, yes. you have touched our lives and you've touched our hearts. Thank and even God. now, our Thank precious you, online viewers, they're Thank responding you. to you. They're responding with their prayer requests. They're, they're saying, Lord, Lord I, I let go. I accept. Lord, I accept. Lord, look at their heart. Not on the outward appearance, but mm. you search 
our hearts and our minds. I please move in their lives. Please, God. Lord, those who who need uh, 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 to, to hear more of a word from you, those who need a closer relationship with you. Lord, we want to encourage them to join us on Monday evenings for our Bible study. Lord, those who need to feel your presence and they need to be uh, uh, lifted up in prayer, we encourage you, we, en we encourage them, Lord, to just pour their, out their heart and their prayer request. Yes, God, you hear. They can go to O-U-C S-D-A forward slash connect. Yes. And Lord, as they do that, reward their faithfulness even before they reach out yes. and give them what they need and answer their prayers according to your will. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm leaving excited. I think I'm burning calories okay. just from the excitement. <laughs> praise God. It was an aerobic uh, worship experience, Amen. so praise God. So I'm Linda, going yeah. to step aside because we have the man of the hour here, All and right. we're going to invite Pastor <laughs> Snell to come on over, and God bless you, Pastor Snell. Thank you so Amen. much for the ministry today. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Pastor Snell. Hey, hey, what's uh, good, Preach? My pastor. Yes, sir, yes, sir. We here, we here, we here. Welcome to Oakwood, sir. Man, Welcome to Oakwood. Welcome I am so Oakwood. excited to be here at Oakwood. Good, good afternoon, Oakwood family. Yes. Uh, those who are here in Huntsville and those who are part of our extended family. Praise God. Thank, glad to be with you. Amen. Today. Listen, Doc, where do I begin, man? <laughs> good night. Good night. That was a word. That was a word. Listen, there's, there's so much that we could unpack, but mm -hmm. I, I know, you know, we may have to <laughs> do the the subsequent weeks. Yeah. But listen, man, I mean, the, the, the idea of settling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Why is that so important, man? Man, because see, and this is, and I think the main thing, I, I, and I don't know if I drove it home accurately okay, enough, okay. is the idea of not living a life that is dependent on your senses. Mm. See, our, our sixth sense has to be a dependence upon the Holy Spirit. Yes. Because, see, I love the way Samuel, once he corrected himself, yes. he says, okay, I know God has someone for me. Yes. But he said no to everyone that is available. And he literally says, I'm not going to sit down until I see every option. Yes. And I think there are times where we tend to make decisions based upon sight. Mm -hmm. Where, all right, whether it's in relationships, it's just one of whoever I can see, mm -hmm. or whether it's housing, like, okay, these are the only ones I can see, or whether it's certain jobs or opportunities, it's whatever I can see. But the thing I want somebody to understand is just, just because you can't see it doesn't mean that God doesn't have something that has been customized yes. for you. Yes, It's tucked away from hidden from everybody else's yeah. view, and it appears in the correct season. Yes, And I just think that there are so many of us that are living with regret, uh, remorse, because we know in our heart of hearts we've settled less than, for less than God's ideal. I love that statement from the book Education where Ellen White says, higher than the highest human thought yes. can conceive. Yes. That's God's, God's ideal, ideal for his children. Yes. And it, I mean, it stuns me. And, I, and I'm trying to walk and live in this, that God wants so much more for us. Yes then we are willing to even imagine yeah, for ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's, that's that main idea. I, I want the people of God to say, I don't have to accept the first thing. I don't have to live in the leftovers. I, I don't have to share. God has yeah. something that is designed for you. But, but, but Doc, it, in order for that to happen, we have to practice patience. Sure. We have to be willing to wait. Yeah. And I know that's hard, man. Yeah. I mean, maybe you're a patient person. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> it's easier to preach than, than it is to live. Uh, that's yeah, that's yeah. true for everybody. Yeah. But, like, one of the things you'll notice when you look in the Word is that there is a there are a plethora mm -hmm. of verses that just talk about waiting on the Lord. Yes. Like, wait yes. on the Lord and yeah. be of good yeah. courage, and he will strengthen thy heart. Thy, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Because, you know, I tell people all the time that faith doesn't die on the operating table. A lot of times faith dies in the waiting room. Mm -hmm. It's when we're in that season in between the promise and its fulfillment that we will we'll tend to kind of settle based upon, you know, kind of what we could see. I mean, I think even when you look at, you know, the children of Israel's, their wilderness sojourn, you know, the reason they were willing to settle in lands that were not Canaan was simply because that's, what they saw at the time. Yeah, yeah. That's what was yeah. visible. That that's easy. That's right now. So, so, so Penny McPherson says, just because I can't see it mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's not there. It doesn't mean it's not there. That's right. <laughs> we got to look through the eyes of faith. Got to look through the eyes. Look of through faith. the eyes yeah. of faith. Listen, Doc. This has just been rich, and 
we are so glad that you're here and we're so excited that you're here. And, you know, I know those of you who are commenting on the chat, I know you've been blessed. But one of the things that I also want to encourage you to do is to continue to watch, continue to engage. You know, there's, we, we try to connect with you and, and hopefully you've signed up in terms of our, our text messaging. But we also want to thank you for your faithfulness in giving because without your support, we wouldn't be able to do half of the things that, that we're doing. And as you can see, there's more that we're trying to do. And so we want to encourage you, if you can, to give. There's a number of ways you can do that, whether it's through our website um, or also through Cash App. But, you know, whatever you're able to do to support the ministry, we want you to do that. Uh, Dot, listen, um, we had a season of prayer. We had a time of prayer because mm -hmm. there's a number of individuals who sure. expressed what they are looking for God to do mm -hmm. for them. Uh, you talked about type and ha recognizing that sometimes we've got to let go mm. of a particular type. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I want you to be able to pray mm -hmm. for our, our, our online audience. Sure. I want you to be able to, to cover them with prayer. I want you to be able to prophesy over them that the things that they're looking to do, sure. that yeah. the Lord, first of all, is in the plans, mm -hmm. that the Lord directs, yeah. but that the Lord blesses. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So please. It's my great joy to be able to do that. Uh, people of God, would you join me in prayer? I know you're at home. Um, if, if you want to just bow your heads, if you want to lift your hands, we, we just ask that you continue with us in this supplication. And, and we wanted to set aside this time just so that we can interact with you. Uh, if you're not able to join us in the building, Father in heaven, we come before you boldly because that's the way you invite us to come. Yes. And Lord, we offer up this prayer for your people, knowing that there is absolutely nothing that is too hard for you. And Father, there's some things that we are praying for on behalf of the people of God. We're praying that the weapons that have been formed against them yes. would not be permitted yes. to prosper. Lord, as these various variants continue to crawl upon the land and compromise the health of your people, Father, we ask in a very, very special way, Lord, that the angel of the Lord would be encamped about your sons and your daughters and they're coming in and in their going out. And so, Father, we, we, we are grateful for masks and, and safety product protocols. But, Lord, we need your divine coverage. Yes. Lord, help us to abide under the shadow of your wing. And I pray that therein we might be able to find safety. Father, we ask in a very special way that whether the weapons are formed on the job or at home or through medical challenge or just through enemies that emerge, Father, I pray that everyone would function with the assurance that these battles don't belong to them, but the battle does belong to the Lord. And then, Lord, I pray that you would give wisdom to your people of God. Lord, give them wisdom for every conundrum. Give them insight for every uncertainty. Lord, wherever there is confusion, wherever there is unrest, Lord, I pray that they would be able to hear your still small voice saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Yeah. And then, Father, I pray for your divine provision. Lord, there are some who are worried and stressed. There are some who could not worship because yes. of the worry. Yes. And, Lord, my prayer is that tonight that you would not just give them sleep, but, Lord, give them rest yes. as they can release every care and every worry and every stress unto your hands. For, Lord, you promised to us that if you keep watch over the sparrow, which is sold for a couple of pennies, Lord, we know that we are of much more value than they. So, Lord, you've said to us that, that if Solomon, who, who was not clothed in all of his splendor like some of the lilies of the field, mm. Lord, we know, Lord, that you are watching over yes. us. So, Lord, yes. I'm praying that you would teach us not to worry teach us to abide in a perfect peace. And lastly, Lord, I pray that you would grow our witness. Even in the midst of a pandemic, Lord, we don't want to take the truth of your word and seal it inside. Lord, we want to be epistle, uh, apostles. We want to be epistles of divine grace. So, Lord, help us to find creative and innovative ways, Lord, to be light and to be salt to those who are in our sphere of influence. I pray specifically, Lord, for the Oakwood Church family, Lord, as there's grief and sorrow and lamentation in the land, yes. Father, I ask in a very special way, Lord, that you would bring hope to the broken, restoration to those who are discouraged, Lord, and hope to those who are bruised by the sorrows and the hurts of this life. And Lord, I pray that you would point us all toward our heavenly uh, home, point us toward our eternal assurance yes. Yes. that you are coming again to save us from the curses of this world. This, Lord, is our prayer. This is our plea, and now it is our expectation, for we pray these things in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Lord. 
Amen. 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 Thank you. Man. So, Doc, this yeah. is day one. Day one. Day one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're a little long on day one. It, 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 won't, always, it won't be, won't this be like this. It won't yeah. always be this long. What can we expect? Uh, uh, what do you have in store for us? Uh, Man, there, there are a lot of things. And so I'm not going to overwhelm you. I just want to talk about maybe the next few weeks. Okay, um, okay. So one of the things, Oakwood, and, and just to our larger Oakwood family, on February 2nd, that Wednesday night, we're going to resume our prayer meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, listen, I believe God says my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. But because it's a pandemic and we want as many people to engage as possible, we're going to be we're going to be creating a virtual prayer meeting that will be meeting each Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. the, 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 this series title, and we're going to be doing a teacher series, myself and the pastoral staff, is simply entitled Signs. And it's talking about how to discern God's mm -hmm. will for your life. And we'll be using some of the, the road signs that you see on the street. So <laughs> okay. we're going to be talking about what it means when you experience a detour. Yes. We're going to be talking about what it means and how to know when it's a biblical merge. Yes. We're going to be talking about how to know when it's time to yield mm -hmm. or when it's time to <laughs> stop or when there is a hazard ahead. Yes. So listen, go ahead on the Oakwood University Church YouTube page. Or you can go to the Breath of Life YouTube page. We're going to be streaming from both sites. Okay. And so that's going to be Wednesday, February the 2nd. And then after next week, as we move into the month of February, we're excited uh, as we celebrate uh, Black History Month. Uh, each and every week, there's going to be a different theme for Black History Month, uh, both in the morning and in the afternoon. So each morning, so that first week, we're going to be talking about black health yes. and its impact on our community. Second week that comes right after or right before Valentine's Day, we're going to mm -hmm. be talking about black love. love. That mm -hmm. third week, um, we're going to be talking about black excellence and wealth. Then that last week, we're going to be talking about the responsibility of the black church, to, in, in, especially in this time. And one of the cool things we're going to be doing for those who are online mm -hmm. is we're going to, I'm going to preach or talk about these things in the morning. But then in the afternoon, yeah. in the afternoon, mm -hmm. We're going to have a virtual conference, yes. a virtual Breath of Life Oakwood University Church Conference based upon the things that we are discussing. And so I'll be giving you more data and details about that right here in the Praise Cafe yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> next, next Sabbath afternoon. So please get ready to join us for prayer meeting and, and stay logged on with us. That we want to build a spiritual community. Yes. Listen, we're trying to set such mm -hmm. a high spiritual climate through the Oakwood University Church and through Breath of Life, that you have absolutely no excuse not to grow spiritually. Listen, I'm literally, I'm about to have like spontaneous combustion. Like, I'm all the way in, Amen. excited about Amen. it. I'm praying that you would join us on this journey. All right. And and you have a Twitter and an Instagram. They, they can join you on that? Yes, yes. Both all of them right. at Pastor Snell, at Pastor Snell on Instagram. And on and on Twitter. And uh, on Twitter. Pastor D. Snell. I yes, think. Pastor D. Snell. Yeah, Excuse yeah. me, Pastor D. Snell. Listen, it's time for for us to go. I know that you. you I know you need to eat. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but listen, man. Thank you so much for blessing us, and thank you for watching. Thank you for being a part of us. Thank you for investing in us, and we look forward to seeing you again next Sabbath. So until then, we're praying the blessings of God on you, and thank you for being a part of the Oakwood University Church.